I've read the fiery gospel written burnished rows of steel As you deal with my condemner so with you my grace shall deal Let the hero born of woman crush the serpent with his heel Since God is marching on All right, welcome to Christian Overcomers, and thank you for joining us for this Bible study. Revelation 17c, Babylon's Wine of Fornication. Revelation 17, 1, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Now, Mystery Babylon isn't just some normal harlot. She is the mother of harlots. And not, not only is she just the mother of harlots, she is a temple prostitute. The queen temple prostitute. In other words, what we're going to see here throughout this chapter is anybody who gets involved with her is partaking in a religious ceremony or sacrifice to the devil himself. Verse 2, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now, why I mention this is a religious ceremony taking place is because the kings of the earth commit fornication with her in a religious ceremony. Now, we're, we're talking in type here. And this will all start coming together for you um, in this study as well as the other studies we are going to do on this topic. But we're, we're going to talk about, we're going to focus in on here today, this wine of her fornication. What's inside this cup? The cup of Mystery Babylon. Well, I'll tell you what, it's not just wine. It's a mixture of other things that I know will shock you when we read of them and talk about them. And likely, or possibly, will even make you sick to your stomach when we find out what's inside this cup. And we're not going to hide, we're not going to, you know, shy away from it. We have to cover it because it's written in God's word and there is a purpose for it. But before we get into exactly what's in that cup, we need to talk about something. I, I posted this on Facebook a few days ago. And the reason being is because I'm studying this chapter. And Mystery Babylon is the, the pinnacle of unfaithfulness to God and, and unfaithfulness in every aspect of someone's life. And you know, the kings of the earth, by committing fornication with her, are unfaithful to the citizens of their kingdoms or the citizens of their nations. So faithfulness is a huge issue in connection with Mystery Babylon. Because everybody, again, because everybody who's involved with her is being unfaithful. Not again, not just to God, but to their neighbor, to their fellow man, to their fellow countrymen, etc. You know, I have to say this, you know, we do a lot of studies on prophecy. We've been in Revelation, we've been covering some deep deep things. But there's always a certain segment of people who are, I guess what you call, 100% of the time, prophecy seekers. 
And there may be some of you listening today um, that are like that. That you just, I mean, prophecy is great. It's wonderful. It's important in God's word. But we also need to learn from prophecy. So if you're one of those people that, hey, you live for prophecy, you're always studying the conspiracy between uh, the conspiracy of Satan to overthrow God's kingdom, the beast, the new world order, and all those types of things that we're going to talk about. But if that's, but if you only take it that far, you're missing a lot because we can learn a lot from Mystery Babylon that we can apply to our own life. Because if we are not faithful in the small things of life, in our personal lives, we ultimately we can't be faithful in much of anything else, much less to God. So it starts in our own lives. That's one of the big lessons given to us about Mystery Babylon. You know, I say this because I've I've run into people throughout the years that study prophecy and they're ready to stand against the Antichrist, but they let Satan into their life in many different avenues. They... Um, get involved with uh, drugs, abuse of alcohol, uh, pornography. And pornography is one we're going to deal with here in this study. But um, it's a very important one to deal with. If you're a Christian and you think, uh, well, all I got to do is get ready for the end times and stand against the Antichrist and this, this pornography addiction I have on the side is not really that important because it's just the flesh. It's more than just the flesh, my friends. And you better take these things serious. All right, let's read this. I, I posted this on Facebook uh, several days ago. The main theme of the Bible is faithfulness. Faithfulness faithfulness to God. Faithfulness to your spouse. Faithfulness to your family. Faithfulness in business. And faithfulness to your neighbor. Though it's tempting to choose quick paths to instant pleasure. The quick paths only provide temporal satisfaction, ending in suffering and pain, while faithfulness is a tree of life, producing fruits of eternal joy. And uh, I quoted here part of Revelation 2 verse 10 where it says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. You know, faithfulness pays off. It brings true happiness. You don't have that sense of guilt. I mean, you don't have that sense of guilt that you have to live with. You don't hurt other people. And you know what? Faithfulness will cause you to be able to stand boldly for Almighty God. Something that is very hard for someone to do unless they're really, you know, they really got issues. So, let's never forget this. We need to do the opposite of what the kings of the earth do with Mystery Babylon. Because we see where that ends. Mystery Babylon ends in torture, in pain, in misery, in sorrow, and it's only for a season. You know, I can't think of, you know, I can think of so many people today that are unfaithful to God, yet they call themselves Christians. And they start supporting homosexuality and, and all kinds of other things and not define them as sin. And they set up the idol of their heart of being accepted by others. So they make, you know, it, it becomes idolatry. It's being unfaithful to the word of God. 
You know, all, all the way back from Genesis to Revelation, it deals either with God's people being faithful or unfaithful. And the consequences and or the blessings as a result. Mystery Babylon goes up in flames with the unfaithful. While the faithful inherit New Jerusalem. That pure and holy city that's undefiled. You know, I had somebody say, well, isn't Jesus the main theme of the Bible? Well, I guess that that that's a good point, but I I guess we could say that Jesus is uh the, we could say this the main theme of the Bible is faithfulness while Jesus is the main object of the Bible. He's the main purpose. But the Bible again, the theme of it is it's faithfulness all the way through. The first and second commandment to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all your soul. The two great commandments, I mean. And the other one is to love your neighbor as yourself. On these two, Christ said, hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, the theme of it is love God, love your neighbor. Be faithful to both. That's the theme of the law. All right. 1 Timothy 3 verse 5. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So if you say you're one of the elect, or you think you're one of God's elect, you think you're chosen to make a stand in these last days, then we better be able to rule our own house. Take care of our own lives first, because if your own life is in chaos and disorder, you cannot serve God. I mean, you have a miniature. That's, I mean, that's your smallest form of government, if you would. Well, first, it is, first is yourself. You have to be able to govern your own self with self-discipline, self-control. And then you got to be able to take that outward to your family, your your. Uh, with your children and your spouse and be able to manage that small government before you can take on the church of God, before you can be a leader in the church. You know, I will, I will say this, and I'm bringing up this verse for a reason because we're going to point out that hypocrisy does more damage to um, the kingdom of God in many cases, than outright attacks by our enemy. Because one hypocrite makes Christianity a laughingstock to so many. So, and I'll say this, you know, if there's anything positive we can take out of what's happening in America today, uh, we could call it post-Christian America, if you would. After the Supreme Court ruling on, on homosexual marriage and the White House displayed the rainbow flag in support of, of, of abominations. Well, we can take, the positive thing we can take from all that is that the flame of persecution is beginning to purify the true church. We're, we're beginning to analyze ourselves more closely. We're beginning to take a look at our hearts and our own lives like never before to purge out those things that would make us into hypocrites. You know, and that's pretty exciting. I've seen it. I've noticed it. I, You know, in my own life, I'm trying to look at things and say, hey, what do I have wrong in my life that I need to purge out of my life so that I can speak boldly on these issues? Obviously, we're not going to be without sin, but I'm talking about habitual things in our lives that would make us hypocrites. It's so important. 
It's so important. All right. Many of you have seen this or have heard of Ashley Madison. This, uh, it, their database got hacked. Uh, I don't know if it was several weeks ago now. And uh, many people were on this database. Many people on this database were exposed. Many famous people. Supposedly many uh, church pastors and others. This is an adultery website where people can hook up and shack up and have illicit sex just for pleasure. You know, and here's the advertisement for it on a billboard. Life is short. Have an affair. Now think about that for a minute. You know, people who don't take the judgment of God seriously are non-believers. They think like this. I mean, hey, if, if you don't have to answer to, to a, uh, an all-powerful God who is our judge, then you may as well, uh, you know, get as much pleasure as, from life as you can. As long as you can get away with it, right? Me, me, me. You know, this is the sort of thing that is destroying America. And it's part of the spiritual war that's taking place that Paul talked about in Ephesians chapter 6. He said we fight against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. You know, this, this is the sort of stuff that's just aimed at destroying the family, corrupting our morals. And it's done on purpose. This is part of Mystery Babylon. Can you see this? If you're a Christian and you're and you're you know you're having thoughts like this or you're into pornography, that's Mystery Babylon. Trying to steal your mind, trying to to pervert your mind and corrupt your heart. All right, now I must move on to the next thing. I've never watched this show, but many of you probably have. The show, I believe it's called uh, 19 Kids and Counting, uh, a, a Christian family whose oldest son on the show um, got caught in a cheating scandal. And um, right away here, you see People Magazine, you know, this is this is really doing damage to Christianity because this guy actually went out and spoke about, uh, I think he, he, he used to go out around the nation and speak out for family values. And now he is the, you know, I guess the worst of hypocrites. He even had said it himself. You know, and, and what's so sad about this is, you know, one Christian like this leading a, 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 a dark secret life can destroy the faith of many and cause our enemies to laugh at Christians. Because they, they, then they say, oh, all Christians are like Josh Duggar. They're all secretly cheaters. They're all secretly having affairs. They're all secretly looking at porn. Mystery Babylon, the allurement of her, the lusts of her, destroyed this man. Uh, who, who could ever trust him now? Of course, he had another thing, another issue when he was 14 for molesting one of his, one or more of his sisters. So, I mean, the, the, this guy's had problems already. But anyways, I'm not going to sit around and judge, judge the guy. We're going to let the Lord do it. But I'm just going to point out what, you know, he said that is, he said that porn addiction led to him having this affair. 
All right. Well, now, I'm going to skip over to Proverbs 5.15. Now, again, when you're looking at Mystery Babylon, we must take this on a physical level as well so that we can understand the spiritual. That's why God ties these in together. He, he calls Mystery Babylon a, a, a whore. So that we can look at a physical whore and get the analogy. We don't want to, what a lot of people do is they always jump right to the spiritual meaning. No, you build up. You build up from the basics and then apply the spiritual lessons. All right, Proverbs 5 verse 15. Drink waters out of thine own cistern and running waters out of thine own well. We're going to be talking about Staying true, staying faithful to your spouse here. That's what it's talking about. Drinking waters out of your own well. 5 verse 16. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and the rivers of water in the streets. Let them be only thine own and not strangers with thee. Let thy fountain be blessed. Now check this out. And rejoice with the wife of thy youth. In other words, stay to your own family. Stay with your own family. Rejoice with your wife or with your spouse. Let her be as a loving hind and a pleasant roe. Let her breasts satisfy thee at all times and be thou ravished always with her love. I mean, hey, this this kind of love, he's talking about um, a sexual relationship here. This is a pure sexual relationship between a man and a woman, between a husband and a wife. And, and the, in the Proverbs here, he's saying, hey, let her satisfy you. Be ravished with her love. Verse 20, and why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? You know, because really think about this. Anything outside of marriage, it's not love. It's lust. It's self-gratification. And eventually, I mean, like, uh, think of, think of, um, well, there's one ac uh, accuser or one woman that says she slept with Josh Duger. Is it Duggar or Duger? I'll just say Duger. Um, she has no problem coming out and slamming him because he used her without caring about her. So why would she have second thoughts on bashing him? You see, this... These kinds of relationships are destructive. They don't love each other. They don't care for each other. So it ends in, in violence, in destruction. So what the, what the father is saying to the son is saying, hey, why would you go with a, why would you go cheat on your wife with a strange woman? You don't, you, I mean, you don't even know anything about her. It doesn't make any sense in the long term. 5 verse 21, For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. In other words, nothing, nothing is hidden from God. And we will be held accountable for what we do. All right, now I'm going to talk about something here. This, this word whore, for mis what Mystery Babylon was called, the word in the Greek is actually porne. It's where we get the, the, the English word porno. Now think about that. And think about it closely. For any, any of you that think that, uh, you know, you can be a Christian and, and look at pornography. 
Again, think about Mystery Babylon. You know, there Satan's children, the serpent's seed on this earth, purposely. It's in their it's in their plans that they call protocols. They purposely infuse our society with pornography to stupefy the population, to corrupt it, and to get it thinking only on a base lustful instinct and to not think about anything spiritual you know you think about uh, these uh, all the many of the men there's hardly any men that stand up and act like men in America today they're either watching football or baseball or sports 24/7 or looking at pornography they're not standing up for their families they're not standing up for their country now, I'm not saying this about, about everybody in America. I'm saying a, a great majority of Americans have become like this now, have become effeminate or, or just do not lead their family. And they get involved with this crap. You know, what's the simple answer? I mean, do we, for somebody who has an issue like this, I mean, yeah, I know there's, uh, you know, counseling and things like that. But isn't it just enough to say just discipline yourself and stop doing that? Cut it out. Grow up. Be a man. Take responsibility for your, for your family, for your, the oaths that you've made, the promises that you made to your spouse. In 2014, this is uh, from the website provenmen.org. A 2014 survey uh, asked, how many Christians do you think watch porn? Nearly two-thirds or 64% of American men look at pornography at least monthly. The rate for Christian men looking at porn is nearly identical. An estimated 21 million men either think they are addicted to porn or are unsure if they are addicted. Those and other numbers are documented in a new survey by Proven Men Ministries um, and conducted by a representative sample of 1,000 adults, U.S. adults nationwide. All right. Just released survey also revealed 8 out of 10 or 79% men between the ages of 18 and 30 view pornography at least monthly. Think about that. Between eight, the 18-year-olds and 30-year-olds, monthly, they're, I mean, this is 80% almost. Two out of three, 67% men between the ages of 31 and 49 view pornography at least monthly. One in two men between the ages of 50 and 68 view pornography at least monthly. One in three men between the ages of 18 and 30 think they might be addicted to pornography or are unsure if they are addicted. Two out of 10, 18% men of all ages think that they might be addicted to pornography or are unsure if they are addicted. These numbers are staggering. Viewing pornography is not limited to single men. Over one half, now check this out, over one half, 55% of married men view pornography at least monthly. The survey also included statistics relating to income, education, and ethnicity, uh, ethnicity which are available at uh, so on and so forth. All right, I'm going to go back there. and I, I don't know if I read the quote on it, but there were other surveys that said that Christians, I think this one might have said that. Let me check back here. Yeah, 
The rate for Christian men looking at porn is almost identical. 64% of Christian men are looking at pornography. I'm going to read a little bit here, uh, Matthew 5, verse 20. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now think about that for a minute. Is pornography righteousness? I think, of course, we would say not. Jesus said, Except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Hey, you know what? Their outward righteousness looked real. But inwardly and in secret, they were hypocrites. Let us not be hypocrites like them. You have heard that, is, that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now think about, you know, in Matthew chapter 5, we've talked about this before. Christ actually, he didn't do away with the law. Like many people claim, oh, you don't have to follow the law anymore. No, he strengthened the law. He said, hey, I don't care if you actually, um, if you don't commit outward adultery, if you don't actually sleep with another woman while you're married. You commit adultery even if you're lusting after her in your heart. That includes pornography. Because it all only has to do with the act of looking with lust. Looking with a desire. It's not talking about, you know, just appreciating the beauty of the opposite sex. It's looking with lust. There's a big difference there. And Jesus said, you've already committed adultery in your heart. You know, God's law is supposed to be written on our hearts as Christians. It was supposed to be like that way a long time ago in the Old Testament as well. Anyways, let's move on. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart, now check this out, their heart is far from me. You know, Christianity, the Bible, is the matter of the heart. You, In other words, you know, uh, what... Um, Christ is saying here, there, there are many people who are religious people, outwardly. Hey, they go to church every Sunday. They do good things in the community. But they commit idolatry from their heart. Other things are more important to them than Almighty God. Though they come off as though, hey, I go to church all the time. The same, you know, the same is here. When you, when, if you're a married man and you're lusting after other women. Or you're looking at pornography. You draw nigh unto your wife with your mouth. And honor her with your lips. But your heart is far from her. And again, we need to, if we don't show faithfulness in the small things, and it's not really a small thing, but if you don't show faithfulness to your own spouse, how can you show faithfulness 
to Almighty God? Or how can anybody else trust you for that matter? Verse 18, but those things which proceed out of the mouth, I'm just kind of skipping around here, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile man, but to eat with unwashing hands defiles not a man. Okay, you know, he was dealing with the Pharisees and their ritualistic washings and, and, and trying to say that those things make you holy. But Jesus said, no, those don't make you holy. It's having a clean heart is what makes one holy. Or at least having the desire to have a clean heart and to be constantly working on it working on having God's laws written in our hearts and in our minds and being motivated with love and, and faithfulness. So adultery and idolatry, which Mystery Babylon is, is, is a type of both, on the physical level, adultery. On the spiritual level, level, idolatry. They are both committed in the heart. That's where they're committed. You don't have to bow down to a physical idol to commit idolatry. You just have to have your heart thinking and wanting to serve other things before Almighty God. So what is inside? Now we're going back to this. I talked about it in the beginning. What is inside Mystery Babylon's cup? I'm going to read about it. Read it here. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand. Now check this out. What's inside of it? Full of abominations. Now, here's where it gets really disgusting. And filthiness of her fornication. Do you know what that means, that last part? Well, let me explain a little bit. Again, we need to look at this from the physical perspective if we are to understand the strength of the spiritual type. In certain pagan ceremonies, a man would have sex with temple prostitutes during their time of menstruation. They would then collect the byproduct of their sex, semen, blood, and other bodily fluids, and offer it up as a drink offering. I know many of you are just probably gagging right now, thinking about that. But this is the illustration that God has given us. He says, what does he say that's inside that cup? It's full of some disgusting things. Not only that, but the product of her fornication, the bodily fluids. And this is offered up as an offering. A drink offering. You know, drink offerings, you got to understand a little bit about drink offerings. When Even in God's word, when sacrifices were made, they'd pour the drink offering out on the, on the animal when they were to, you know, whether it was a burnt offering or whatnot. It was part of the sacrificial system, and pagans use it as well. They had their drink offerings. And in a sense, you could look at this as the opposite cup that Christ took up when he, when he said, hey, drink you this. This is the blood of the new covenant. When he had the wine was symbolic of the blood of the new covenant. So you have Christ's holy 
um, this is in a sense holy communion. When people partake of this cup, they're partaking of the cup of Satan. So let's talk a little bit about what this means. The elite, we go, Revelation 17, verse 2, I'm going to reread this here. With whom the kings of the earth, mystery Babylon, have com, or with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So the kings or the elite get pleasure they're the ones committing fornication, not the inhabitants of the earth. All right? There's a difference there. The kings are going in, and, and, and you know, if you're a non believer, you'd say, well, this isn't fair. They get pleasure, and we don't get anything. But the elites get pleasure while we are forced to consume the byproduct of their adulterous affair. By that I mean civilization in general pays a price due to their fornication. So this cup you could think of as the product of the adulterous affair. And we'll talk a little bit about what that is here in a second, but you know, so so the kings of the earth, if we were to translate this into the spiritual sense, they're the ones who get all the perks, the benefits. They get to drive around and you know, and they're um, you know living the high life and the fancy cars, the the big black uh, what do you call those Escalades and so forth, as royalty. They don't have to um, follow all the laws they pass. Like Obamacare, they, you know, they 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 get the um, uh, a pass on those things. You know, it's much like a, a a physical marriage. When one spouse has an adulterous affair, the whole family pays for the sins of that one spouse, because it's going to break up and destroy the family. And that's what these leaders are doing to us. They're being unfaithful to us and succumbing to their own lusts. You know, have you ever wondered their own lusts of wanting power, wanting fame, wanting control, wanting you know, anything? You know, there, there are actually real circles of prostitution for our political leaders. They, you know, every once in a while they get uncovered and somebody speaks out. So th this is oh, this is happening on, on multi dimensions. It's happening both in the flesh as well as the spirit. But you ever wonder why Republicans and Democrats are often two shades of the same color? By that I mean, at, at, when it's all said and done, they basically end up in the same place, even though they talk a different game. It's because the establishment, and this is the lesson of Mystery Babylon. God's trying to tell us your kings, your leaders are being unfaithful to you. It's because the establishment of both parties are in bed with Mystery Babylon. They put their adulterous affair first. Their lust has consumed them. Just like the lust of an adulterous spouse consumes them, and the loyalty and loyalty and faithfulness are forgotten. Now, they do everything for these things, free trade, world economy, 
the New World Order. And that's why we have uh, mass immigration. That's why many times both parties, at least the elite in both parties, promote mass immigration, legal and illegal, from third world nations. Their desire is not towards America. It's not America first. It's their power in exchange for promoting all these types of things, ultimately leading towards a new world order. You know, uh, President Bush, both Bushes actually spoke of a new world order. The senior Bush, I think, spoke of it, I don't remember how many times. I thought I thought it was like 200 times or something like that, but I, I cannot verify that. But there are videos of him on YouTube calling for a new world order. You know, it's, it's much the same as uh, people of both parties wanting to spread democracy around the world without the gospel of Jesus Christ. They just figure, oh, we'll just go free everybody. Well, then that becomes an idol as well because that's, that's all done to, to, do, to finally try to bring this together, the new world order. And what do we get? We get more taxes, more debt, loss of freedom, and a moral and spiritual decline in our nation. In other words, we're drinking the cup of the wine of their fornication. And you think about that. Think about if somebody was physically doing this and saying, hey, drink the cup. Most of you, if you, you know, most people, if they could think of it in the physical sense, would be like, heck no, that is disgusting. Well, that's how we ought to view this cup in Mystery Babylon's hand. It's the disgusting byproduct of the uh, uh, fornication and idolatry of our leaders. And we don't want to drink any of it. That brings me to uh, some another current event I'm going to throw in here while we're at it. You know, Donald Trump, um, I'm going to read this here. It says, uh, I wrote here just nine hours ago, it says here, pretty close to that, on Facebook. I love how Donald Trump stares political correctness in the face and how he doesn't rehearse everything he is going to say before he says it. He just says what's on his mind. It, it, it's so refreshing. A lot of his policies are great, too. I just wish he were a little more humble and a little more Christian. It will be interesting to see how this plays out. God works in mysterious ways. If God used a pagan king named Cyrus to protect the remnant of Judah back in Ezra chapter 1, verse 1, who is to say he can't use Donald Trump to protect Christians from persecution in America and abroad? Donald Trump claims he would be the first president in a long time to do so. Now, again, I'm going to stress that I'm not saying Donald Trump has always been a moral man or is a godly man because, you know, I watched some videos of him explaining how he's never really asked for forgiveness. You know, that, and that's he's got a pride issue there. And we know to be a true Christian, you have to ask for forgiveness. Otherwise, you're saying that Jesus, Jesus Christ's blood was unnecessary to be shed on the cross for our sins. So Donald Trump has a huge pride problem there. But nevertheless, he said, I mean, he's, I mean, he comes out and he seems honest about what he says. Am I saying we should trust him 100%? No, I'm not. But it is refreshing to see somebody come out and, and really bash political correctness and just say things the way they are. And why I bring this up is because it, it, it would appear that Donald Trump 
and I'm not, you know, trying to say vote for Donald Trump or anything like that, but I want to give an example that it appears as though he's an outsider to the establishment. I mean, this guy has already has riches and wealth, and perhaps God would use him in that role because of that. I don't know. But uh, nevertheless, if he is truly an outsider, he already had all the perks before getting into politics. Maybe he would not be bought out by Mystery Babylon. Maybe that's why a lot of people like him. I don't know. Again, I'm not endorsing Donald Trump. I'm not saying he's a godly man. I'm just saying God does work in mysterious ways. He can take a prideful man, even a pagan man, and use him to, to, to expose wickedness or to protect his people and so forth. All right, hey. I just, you know, I wish our our conservative Christians would would be as bold as Donald Trump is against political correctness and not sitting there worrying. But what other people think of us. But just say the truth. Stand up and be a man or a woman. And not a coward, not a limp-wristed, uh, you know, sweaty-palmed uh, spiritual wimp. And not try to say, you know, try to word thing, word everything just so right, so not to offend anybody. So perhaps he could be, uh, perhaps he'll rub off on some Christians in that manner and teach them how to stand up and get a little courage. Anyways, Mystery Babylon. A corrupt religious and economic system flowing forth from one city under the direction of one family whose aim is to deceive the world. And um, here we have back in the background here Ishtar from Babylon, who was the symbol of Mystery Babylon, the mother goddess. Hey, we got several more, at least several more exciting studies in this series. I feel we've only just kind of scratched the surface going in, and um, and I think we're gonna we're gonna have a um, we're gonna get a deeper understanding of what Mystery Babylon represents and, and and what it means to us in prophecy. I hope. Anyways, hey, do like what Christ said in Matthew chapter five when he was tempted of the devil. He said, "Man does not live." Or Matthew chapter four when he was tempted of the devil. He said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So see that you study his word, consume it every single day, instead of the cup that Mystery Babylon wants to pour out upon us, so that you can be a Christian overcomer. Christian Overcomers is brought to you by the tithes and offerings of our listeners. If you'd like to support our ministry, please go to ChristianOvercomers.com God bless you and thank you for your support. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible sword. His truth is marching on.